before we, we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know the, the, how exactly you can participate in today's event. We have taken a screenshot of attendee interface. Uh, you should see something like this in your desktop or uh, right-hand side top corner. Um, if you have any questions, you can actually uh, go ahead and start uh, typing in your questions under a chat window. Our people in standby will be answering all your questions. And also we will be answering all those questions in Q&A sessions. And, and also we will be sending a list of questions and answers after this webinar as well, maybe within uh, 24 to 48 hours. So uh, for those of you just joining us, welcome for this uh, uh, Mirabilis Designs webinar uh, and ways to confirm your uh, architectural decisions in integrated modular avionics architecture. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, the main purpose of this webinar is to understand various challenges involved in adopting integrated modular avionics architecture itself and understanding how these challenges can be addressed at the early stages of your design cycle to make sure that uh, the design is free from uh, critical challenges and going across kind of uh, product race pins, things like that. And also I'll be talking about uh, a few concepts from Ring 653 as well. And, uh, and also to make sure that uh, the architecture that you'll be selecting is going to give you better performance um, uh, by performing a kind of a space and time partitioning itself. So we'll look at some of the examples or demo examples uh, during the course of this webinar itself. And also we'll try to understand uh, whether really early design uh, explorations can confirm the unknown portions of your uh, uh, system architecture components itself. So you're very sure that at the early stages of your design cycle, you may not have enough information about your complete system. You may not have information about the output range or an algorithm that you'll be selecting, whether you'll be going with a a multi-core uh, processor platform or a multi-processor based platform, things like that, and the memory uh, requirements that you need to go with, and the kind of interconnects that you need to uh, use for your uh, next generation avionic system requirements. We will try to address all these uh, challenges uh, during this uh, presentation itself. For those of you who is not aware of or who has not heard about Mirabilis Design or Visual Sim Architect, we are a uh, Silicon Valley based uh, systems engineering company and we provide software solutions for architecture exploration, power and performance analysis of your uh, avionics and uh, semiconductor systems. Our major product is called Visual Sim, which is a completely graphical and simulation, hierarchical modeling and simulation environment. So I'll be showing you some of the uh, examples in the area of avionics itself um, uh, later in this presentation. So that actually gives you a feel about how quickly you can construct models and try to understand how uh, you can address uh, the challenges that I mentioned uh, earlier uh, in this presentation uh, using uh, system level modeling and simulation itself. So if you I want to look at the kind of uh, different your avionics uh, uh, pauses. So let's go ahead and look at some of the uh, background details about how exactly uh, we landed up in IMA architecture and what are the advantages that, that IMA architecture itself provides. As you all know that the advances in semiconductor industry is actually having a greater influence on various markets, be it a of semiconductors in terms of uh, consumer electronics or automotive industries or even industrial applications and avionic systems. So as a result of it, we are seeing a lot of consolidations happening in avionic system and, uh, and efforts are made to achieve better performance and reduction in total power consumption and uh, the total weight of, of your complete system itself and uh, how can I increase my uh, reliability of my complete system itself. 
So the goal of uh, IAM integrated modular avionics architecture is to combine a number of traditional and standalone federated systems into an integrated common platform. So the major purpose is to uh, improve your uh, power efficiency and uh, reduction in number of uh, processor boards and reduction in number of uh, LRUs that you will be using. So as a result of it, you can see a kind of reduction in total uh, uh, system weight as well, uh, at meeting your performance and power requirements. So uh, migration from a federated architecture to an IMA architecture uh, addressed definitely a lot of problems of uh, what, what we were looking at at the level of federated architecture. But there are still challenges that needs to be addressed in IMA architecture and uh, uh, fortunately most of those problems can be addressed at early stages of your design cycle. So some of the uh, typical challenges that we can uh, look at in any of uh, the complex avionic systems such as IMA itself could be a, a contention in terms of uh, processing resources or communication bandwidth or even contention in terms of uh, memory access times, things like that. And also other parts of the kind of challenges that you would be uh, looking at uh, would be how do I identify my bottlenecks uh, because of, uh, of the presence of shared resources in my platform. So uh, as we know that we actually going into a platform talking about multi-core processor platforms in which you will have to have uh, uh, or talk to uh, uh, the memory resources maybe in the same uh, cabinet or maybe it has to go through, uh, go across a uh, shared bus architecture to another cabinet and get the data from there. So there could be scenarios something like that. And apart from that, uh, the problems could be how do I partition my uh, uh, system into, uh, uh, how do I partition my application into multi-core uh, platform, multi platform itself and uh, achieve a better performance by performing parallel and threaded applications. So when we talk about multi-threaded applications or parallel applications, we will have to consider one more uh, very interesting point here is, so uh, the tasks or uh, the timing critical task or hard real-time tasks has to be executed in a given timing deadline uh, and also you need to make uh, the context switching cycles uh, involved in uh, executing these uh, real-time and hard real-time applications will not impact on the total end-to-end -end latency of, uh, of, of those applications that you'll be running on the target platform. A couple of other challenges that, uh, that, we, that we can see in uh, integrated modular avionics includes configuring of your Ring 653 itself. How, uh, how many number of partitions I should go with and what would be the timing duration I should allocate for each, each of the partition that I've selected and how I should distribute my task in each partitions. So do I need to allow, for, uh, allow each task for going above the timing deadlines or whether I should have a kind of a strict restrictions on each task to make sure that those uh, applications are executed in a given timing deadline. If not, you'll have to consider it as a kind of dead uh, tasks or something like that. Uh, and uh, if you look at the communication closely, uh, the challenges are uh, such as, for example, you need to have a kind of knowledge of timing behaviors of, of the access of internal networks is a kind of fundamental requirement and user must determine at what time an access is made and where and when a message is actually sent across the network and whether that particular task or whether that particular message has reached its destination or not. You need to make sure that you have a missing capability to make sure that uh, uh, the execution across your platform is happening correctly and uh, it is not going to have completely different nodes or things like that. So how do I, how, how, how can I address these problems uh, using our least system uh, level explorations? That could be one of your questions right now in front of you. 
So we can address these challenges in multiple ways. For example, if we look at uh, only uh, uh, power requirements or power uh, related challenges, we can actually address these issues uh, by using a simple spreadsheet or things like that. But it, spreadsheet will not be able to provide you uh, uh, system behaviors and uh, dynamic uh, activities that are happening in your platform itself. And you may actually uh, try to select with uh, uh, SysML or UML based approaches or maybe write a C or C++ based models to understand uh, system behavior under various uh, workloads, things like that. But again, uh, you need to spend a lot of time on constructing those simulation models and integrating those uh, models together and understand how uh, simulation or how system is going to behave under various different workloads itself. A modeling and simulation will actually allow you to of some architecture itself. By running multiple simulation runs with uh, uh, what's your variety of sizing workloads, things like that, you can try to uh, configure your architecture and make sure that uh, the selected architecture is going to perform uh, based on your requirements. And also you can try to understand what parts of your system can be uh, executed on your hardware platform or what part of your system can be executed on as a software part. And one more very interesting point uh, that I would like to point out is uh, we have noticed that nearly about 70% of files are injected at the level of uh, system level design itself. So this helps uh, the designers to kind of uh, reduce fault eliminating costs later in the design cycle. and uh, so that you will not be actually coming back uh, uh, into the initial levels and increasing the total system cost itself. So, how exactly modeling and simulation can help uh, can help you or in identifying the possible challenges in your system architecture? Let's look at a scenario right now, and. Uh, and in, in this particular slide, I'm trying to understand or capture details such as how uh, how uh, one can capture unpredictable system behavior uh, by running uh, uh, simulations using uh, various configurations, things like that. So the graph that you're looking at uh, right now is is actually the execution of. of Act, or activity of, of a processing unit and here we have two processing units and the red dot actually represents my ECU1 and the blue one represents my uh, ECU2 itself. So you can see that the activity is almost identical and it is almost or deterministic I can say and let us consider this as your version 1 of your system architecture and uh, let us say you want to run or uh, maybe a or two more applications or ten more applications on the same platform. And you, are, you would be still expecting uh, the hardware platform to still behave in the same manner. And uh, when we look at the simulation runs over here, till 1.2 simulation time, uh, the activity of, of the hardware resources or the processing resources were perfectly fine. But after that particular timestamp, uh, activity of my or behavior of ECU1 started uh, completely differently which means it's um, the activity of ECU1 is completely unpredictable so what would be the problem whether the problem is with your hardware or whether the problem is with your software part of your system so when we actually dig uh, 
more details into this particular problem and when we looked at the statistics of, of the system behavior and uh, things like that, we actually noticed that the problem is really because of the hardware architecture. Muted. architecture. So we have noticed that uh, uh, there was a problem with, uh, with the communication channel itself and the communication channel gets locked after sending uh, 20 transactions. So uh, the slave device, it was not actually sending any hardware acknowledge, um, acknowledgement messages back to the uh, uh, master device. So that was actually causing uh, uh, a kind of completely blackout of the communication channel itself. And as a result of it, the EC1 or processing unit U1 was not receiving any activities at all. So these kind of kind of unpredictable system activities can be identified at the early stages of your design cycle with the help of modeling and simulation itself. And to give you more understanding about how uh, how you can or what kind of uh, problems that you can capture at, uh, using early system modeling, I would like to uh, quickly go over to Visual Sim model and uh, try to explain you a scenario. And I'm going to open up one Visual Sim model right now. And uh, the model that you are looking at right now uh, is actually a, a dual uh, processor module with a, two processors and a DSP and an I.O. connected or a bus and a bus bridge. And these resources are running at specific uh, clock speeds. CPUs are running at 400 megahertz, and bus one is running at 400 megahertz, and bus two is running at 200 megahertz. And we have defined our software applications as a sequence of tasks at the bottom over here, which means, for example, if I receive some tasks from my IVO card over here, or IVO board, so I will actually go to my CPU across something like this, I'll go across IVO to bus one and go to my CPU, and if I want to go to my DSP, I'll go across my bus one, bridge bus two, and go to DSP, and then go back to my IVO. So that completes my complete uh, execution of my task itself. So if you want to understand what is the end-to-end -end latency involved in this particular uh, uh, process of execution, I, if I run simulation for this particular model, so I'm actually capturing my end-to-end -end latency for application two over here, and each dot represents a, a particular task that has been completely executed on the particular platform. And if you look at the peak latency of application two, you can actually see that the peak latency is just under 1.5 uh, microseconds. And if you look at some of the statistics that we have captured over here, my CPU one is utilized about 92 percent, which is definitely dangerous situation, and I have my CPU two, which is utilized about 55 percent. So this actually clearly tells me I need to move certain applications all the way from CPU one to CPU two, so that I'll actually have a kind of balancing there, and I will not be burdening my uh, uh, CPU one itself. So I will have uh, enough room for running other application on my CPU one itself. So at this point, let me make a minor change to this particular model, and I'm going to increase this bus two clock speed from 200 megahertz to 400 megahertz. And when I do this particular change, I would be expecting my end-to-end -end latency to come uh, uh, really low. And when I run the simulation again, I can see that most of the tasks are executed just under 1.2 microseconds. It is actually 1.2, 10 to the power minus 6. And we can still see that there are certain tasks that are going above 1.5 microseconds. So this is completely unpredictable. In the earlier case, you have seen that even with your bus running at lesser clock speed, you, you actually saw a better performance. But when you have increased your clock speed, you would be expecting your latency to come down, but there are certain tasks that are going above your itself. So this could be a kind of factor. At this particular point, uh, the problem could be with your processor platform itself. Your processor may be uh, very slow, 
sending a lot of traffic to your processor card, but uh, it started buffering because it is already running the tasks. So was your clock speed, or you may have to go with a kind of higher configuration of your uh, understand your system behavior and capture uh, kind of bottlenecks uh, as early as possible in your uh, system design itself. So at this point, I'm going to go back to uh, the slides back. And a couple of other uh, concepts that I would like to talk about includes uh, ensuring your timing uh, partitioning itself. So you achieve your uh, uh, timing deadline or, uh, or meeting timing requirements for your real-time or hard real-time applications. You need to make sure that uh, you are protecting your processor and communication bandwidth itself. And apart from that, you need to make sure that the schedule is completely deterministic and uh, you're providing uh, time slots for each of the partitions uh, and make sure that the tasks which are falling in those partitions are, uh, are, are executed in a given timing deadline itself and they are not crossing the timing deadlines. If you see the graph at the bottom over here, we actually have a kind of frame time of about 80 milliseconds and we have split this into 20 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds, 20 and 20 of four different partitions. And each partition uh, can be dedicatedly processing uh, uh, tasks from various applications. So in this case, partition one can be, uh, could be responsible for uh, 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 cockpit applications and partition two could be responsible for networking related activities and pa process three or uh, partition three can be responsible for some other applications that I'm running on my platform itself. So to give you a kind of little more uh, information about how you can partition, partition your scheduling and make sure that uh, the tasks are executed in the given timing deadline or not. Let me quickly go to a visual sim model right now and uh, try to explain how uh, you can model those scenarios. In this case, here we have a very simple, uh, uh, or uh, I, would, I would say miniaturized uh, IMA architecture itself. And here here, I have uh, three different cards that include processor card, graphics card, IO card, and they are powered using two power cards on the both sides. So if, if you have, uh, if your power card one goes down, your power card two should start powering all your data. And these cards are sitting on, on our VPX backlink. The kind of analysis that you would be interested in conducting over here would be, what happens if I change my, uh, or increase or reduce my AFDX speed itself. So what happens if I increase or reduce my slot time allocated? So in this case, we are actually providing number of slots as four, which is fixed over here. And these green blocks are actually the hierarchical blocks. And inside each block, we have defined the uh, complete functionality or behavior of, of a uh, processing card itself. I'm not going to go into details of this particular model. What I'm going to do is I'm going to run simulation for this model. And if you look at the uh, graph in the top left corner, here we are capturing uh, uh, the latencies or, or the plots or the, or the activities across the processor itself. And we have a frame time of about 80 milliseconds. And we have split that into four parts. And uh, the uh, one or partition one, and uh, the blue one is uh, uh, partition two, and so on and so forth. And also, we are capturing uh, the data such as how many number of tasks that are being rejected out of each partitions, so that you can take care of, uh, uh, you can try to understand why these tasks are being rejected, and. Uh, uh, what, what is the way of work around solution for that. In this case, what we are doing here is we are actually capturing details such as my task number two from slot four is actually rejected. And uh, that particular task is actually took about 20.9 milliseconds of time for executing itself. 
So you can try to capture this kind of minute level of information and make sure that all your time critical uh, real time or hard real time applications are executed in a given uh, timing deadline itself. So I'm going to go back to uh, the presentation again. And uh, if we look at the kind of uh, challenges or architecture challenges we have looked at so far, and we can clearly say that we have to conduct varieties of tests to make sure are addressed um, at the early st stages. So uh, those could be uh, the end-to-end -end latency of your communication or end-to-end -end latencies of your applications that you're running itself, and uh, understanding the flow trace. Uh, to make sure that uh, the data is going from one node to another node in a, uh, uh, I mean, as you are expecting. And it is not providing you a kind of unpredictable uh, tracing activities, or things like that. And apart from that, you need to make sure that uh, all, almost all your t critical tasks are executed in a given time deadline. Uh, with the help of your deterministic scheduling uh, mechanisms and things like that. And in addition to that, as power consumption is one of the crucial factor, so you need to make sure, uh, you need to keep on monitoring how much power consumption is happening by each and every uh, subsystems in your platform. So if, if any of the subsystems are going above uh, uh, the threshold, so you can actually go back and uh, try to optimize that power consumption itself at the early stages. So these are the kind of different tests that uh, you can uh, try to conduct. And uh, as I've seen certain models uh, till now, I have actually run a couple of models to show you kind of understanding about how models are simulated and uh, uh, used for capturing the problems. We actually used uh, our product Visual Sim Architect to construct models and uh, run simulations. As you have seen, uh, the models are constructed uh, completely using graphical and hierarchical approach. And uh, the major purpose of constructing those simulation models is to understand your architecture elements itself, why you are selecting a particular uh, architecture component, and what is the advantages of the architecture component itself and try to understand what would be the possible bottleneck. And apart from that, try to capture performance analysis uh, values itself, be it end-to-end -end latency or be it throughput out of a particular uh, node itself, or it could be the utilization of various resources that are available in your platform. And one of the other crucial uh, points uh, where visuals have, helps you to kind of uh, explore your model is to try to partition your hardware and software itself. So you, you can, uh, with the help of your modeling, you can try to make sure that what happens if you move certain application to a software as opposed to the hardware, whether you are seeing an impact on, in terms of performance or whether you are seeing in, impacts in terms of power consumptions, things like that. And all these models are constructed using uh, our, our large library sets, and library components are completely configurable, so that uh, you can always construct any of, of, of your proposed uh, system architecture, whether it is a card score, or whether it is a stand-up component, or whether it is a customized one uh, that is Generate, uh, that is created by your company itself. So the library blocks are completely customizable and uh, configurable. So you can uh, construct any of those models or the libraries that you want to uh, include as part of your system model itself. So the kind of system level explorations uh, Visual Sim allows you to conduct uh, includes uh, evaluation of your performance and power uh, uh, trade-off studies itself. And we have seen that uh, nearly 90% of accuracy uh, in terms of performance and power consumption uh, uh, has been achieved with uh, most of the customers. And in addition to that, you can predict your uh, uh, performance in terms of communication channels, performance or your application performance. It's understand throughput that you're getting out of a particular um, network node things like that. 
and, and also in addition to that, you can inject varieties of faults into your system as well. When I say faults, faults can be anything all the way from your software to hardware or networking or it could be a manual error that uh, that can be modeled and that can be injected to your uh, simulation model to try to understand uh, you know, the system behavior under critical conditions itself. So the major goal of uh, uh, modeling and simulation with VisualSim is to spend work and try to uh, kind of achieve more using uh, uh, running more and more analysis using uh, the model itself so that you will not be uh, spending a lot of time on learning the modeling concepts and so instead of that you will be uh, spending a lot of time on understanding your architecture and making sure why you have selected a particular architecture element and what is the advantage out of it itself. So to give you an idea, uh, recently one of our customer was working on a you know, fighter aircraft and in that, uh, within 15 days of modeling work of a subsystem uh, in that particular complete avionics architecture, they actually found a major bug uh, uh, in that uh, particular, uh, using that particular model itself. So other, other, uh, if they had not used VisualSim or maybe uh, tools like VisualSim, they would have spent nearly four to five months to uh, go to a level to understand or to go to a level to capture those kind of challenges itself. So to give you a little more idea about how exactly models are constructed, if you look at this particular uh, block diagram, uh, this is actually a VisualSim model that we have constructed recently. And uh, this is um, a very complex uh, or little complex IMA architecture and in which he, here we have uh, two cabinets in which we have a uh, different a number of uh, processor modules are sitting and you have uh, power supply modules powering all these power processor modules and you have rapid IO as an inter between these uh, different processor modules itself and also you have an AFDX switch, uh, redundant AFDX switch uh, which is very important tool in communicating between multiple uh, uh, cabinets itself. And also if you look at, at the bottom, here we have a list of uh, IO devices connected that could be uh, the discrete data transfer or it could be the CAN data or adding photo 9 which are connected to a PCI Express to an AFDX and, uh, to communicate with the rest of the system itself. So one of the questions that you may have at this particular point is, do I really need to start off with a full system model? Do I need to have complete information about my uh, uh, complete avionics? So uh, the answer is a big no. You don't have to have information about your complete system module. For example, you can start off with your processor module explorations or your, just about your uh, AFDX network itself or uh, just try to understand how PCI is uh, interacting with your AFDX and uh, uh, IO subsystems itself. You can start off with a, a subsystem level and then you can leverage your system model to a, a complete system level model itself. To give you an idea right now and um, the model that you are looking up right now is a, a fairly uh, simple AFDX uh, uh, N system models in which we have two AFDX switches. Each switches are having uh, uh, two redundant switches inside and this is actually our library blocks that we, have, that we uh, ship it to our customers and these switches are connected to the transmitter and receiver interfaces which are again connected to uh, the traffic generators. So these AFTX traffic generators actually uh, emulate uh, the real traffic coming out of uh, AFTX channel itself. So either you can feed in your uh, or you can model your AFTX traffic using our library blocks itself. The green block that you're looking up right now uh, over here is actually the configuration table 
uh, for for the complete AV, uh, AFDX module itself. In here, you can have a varieties of traffic generation capabilities, and you can maintain your VLAN tables, and also you can maintain your routing information from one node to another node itself. So you can try to explore your uh, AFDX uh, network alone, and once you are convinced with your AFDX network itself, then you can integrate create this to your uh, full uh, IAMA architecture itself. So if you look at the simulation results that I'm capturing right now over here is um, I'm actually looking at the end-to-end -end latency of uh, uh, various nodes over here and I can actually see that there is a kind of exponential uh, increase in my end-to-end -end latency. So this actually tells me that I don't have enough bandwidth across my network and as a result of it, I'm seeing a kind of uh, buffering activities that are happening across my network itself. And if I look at the text display that I'm capturing over here, I can capture my uh, task trace data as well. So that tells me from where to where you are uh, sending the data and that allows you to kind of think a particular data from a specific uh, point to a specific uh, point itself and you're not going uh, above or below uh, uh, to a kind of required uh, connections or things like that. Tells me about how I can evaluate my uh, AFDX networks. But what about my scheduling algorithms and how can I model my IN653 requirements and things like that? So let's quickly go to our kind of simulation model right now, and this is a simplified version of uh, adding 653 functional behavior. And in this case, what we have over here is we actually have a single traffic source that generates traffic at a, uh, a specified, and uh, we actually have a kind of uh, queuing resource that actually models uh, the virtual machines. So in this case, what we have is we have a number of VMs selected as five VMs. Uh, this is my what five virtual machines I have right now here. And I have defined my hardware architecture at the top. So here I have my cache, or here I have my SDRAM itself, and also I have my processing unit model over here. And uh, we have also defined the deadlines for uh, for for the adding 653 uh, or scheduling itself. So in this case, what we have mentioned is we mentioned a timing deadline of about 215 microseconds for each of the partitions. So if you look at the database block that I'm having over here, so here I have information about time slices that are given for each virtual machines uh, itself. So in this case, I have five VMs, and uh, the first VM is actually having a time slice of, of about 150 microseconds, and the next one goes to 140 microseconds, and so on and so forth. So uh, when I run the simulation for this particular model, so what I can try to capture is uh, how many number of tasks are uh, successfully passed uh, the deadline limit. So in this case, the successful transfers are uh, plotted in blue color at the bottom, and the fail, uh, the tasks that have failed for uh, meeting the timing deadlines are plotted in red color over here. And also we have some information plotted in text color, uh, sorry, text report as well. So why exactly uh, a specific task is You did. Uh, what happens if I change my number of VM from 5 to 8, whether that gives me a better performance? Or uh, what happens if I increase my deadline by about 10%, whether that allows me to kind of meet my timing requirements uh, without uh, losing any kind of other uh, critical part of my system architecture itself. 
or if I increase my uh, heat ratio for my process architecture itself, whether that will be able to kind of uh, compensate uh, the total time uh, processing unit has taken for processing all these uh, different tasks itself. So what I'm going to do at this particular point is I'm going to increase my uh, deadline limit by about 10% and I'm going to make this to uh, 225 microseconds and see what is the impact of that on the target platform. Interestingly, when we, have, when we run the simulation now, I don't see any of the tasks that are being rejected. Almost every tasks that are going across my processing platforms are successfully uh, executed in a given timing deadline itself. So, similarly, you can conduct explorations to make sure you're not having a kind of rejections in your platform or uh, you're not having a lot of rejections in your uh, platform itself. And a couple of other plots that I did not explain includes uh, the activities happening in, in the hardware platform itself. They're capturing details such as my activity of my uh, microprocessor itself. You can actually see a kind of bigger uh, width of the plot for microprocessor act activity. The reason is microprocessor time is actually taken nearly about one frame uh, time for, okay, and the plot that you are looking at right now over here is actually uh, in each virtual machines uh, is taken uh, for processing each of those uh, distributed processes itself. And more uh, complex details into the model and capture uh, uh, the system behavior in a better manner as well. So once you are uh, confident enough with your uh, subsystem level of uh, modeling, then you can integrate everything up in a, a simulation model, in a single simulation model, and try to understand the challenges in terms of connectivity between multiple Muted. Self, and also capturing details such as how many tasks are exceeded the deadlines or how many uh, survived uh, the deadline requirements itself. So if you look at in this particular uh, slide here, I'm actually uh, giving you a kind of a model of a, a very higher abstract uh, uh, network model itself. In this case, we have multiple nodes. Uh, in this case, node 1 and node 2 are the source nodes, and whereas uh, mu p1 and mu p2 are the destination nodes. And in between, we are actually uh, sending the data across this particular node from node 1 to node 3, and then node 3 to node 5, and then finally reach uh, mu p1 itself. So, it, in fact, you would be interested in understanding what happens if a particular link goes down after some time period, a uh, broken link on the total system performance. So whether that has a uh, greater impact on the total system performance or system functionality itself, or is it just about a kind of uh, the redundant networks can handle that kind of uh, problems itself. So uh, you can actually as well, but in this case we have kept it as a very higher 
uh, abstraction level itself. And these communication details or routing informations are provided or updated in the routing uh, table itself. So, in the simulation model, uh, simulation of this particular model, we can actually try to see uh, the details such as what is the bandwidth that I'm capturing or getting for, for a specific link. In this case, I'm actually looking at the connections between node 1 to node 3 and I'm actually getting a kind of bandwidth of about 100 Mbps of our, uh, our transactions itself. And also you can still see uh, some other tasks are not reachable at and they're not providing information about what's really going on. And also you can try to capture end-to-end -end latency across your network itself. So in this case, uh, the first one, uh, which is actually at the kind of zero, below 0, 0.0, so we actually removed the connection between node 3 to node 5, uh, uh, and later on we actually added that particular link back. And as a result of it, we were seeing a kind of increased uh, uh, latency at this particular point itself. So similarly, you can conduct varieties of uh, explorations by adding additional links or moving uh, nodes from one domain to another domain and understanding uh, 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 the problems involved in that or the kind of challenges involved in that and how to address those challenges itself. So as I mentioned before, uh, understanding the tracing details is also very crucial and in this case we are actually identifying uh, the tracing details between node 2 to my uh, uh, microprocessor itself. So the communication goes across something like node 2 to node 3, and then node 3 to node 5 and finally it reaches its destination microprocessor uh, to itself. So this enables you to kind of uh, make sure that all the communications are happening correctly and uh, there are no uh, chance for unpredictability over there. So to be able to model uh, these kind of uh, complex uh, system architectures, we actually provide you uh, uh, configurable library blocks. And here we have listed uh, kind of very few uh, libraries that are relevant for Avionix applications. And here we have all the libraries all the way from your interfaces to your networkings, including your FTX buses, TT Ethernet or Ethernet and crossbars and rapid IOs and other processor libraries and memories, things like that as well. So you can make use of these uh, pre-configured libraries and uh, start building your uh, simulation models uh, itself. So, uh, to conclude this presentation, or to conclude this webinar, so uh, the major idea behind uh, conducting early system level modeling uh, is for, for a complete, of a complete IMA platform is to provide greater visibility into your problems and, posi and identifying possible solutions uh, uh, itself. And also you can try to inject as many as 70% of uh, faults at the early stages of your product development and make sure that uh, uh, the challenges are addressed within 20% of your project time itself and uh, that makes sure that the IMA is uh, going to work perfectly fine after 5 years or 10 years or 15 years down the line itself. And in addition to that, uh, understanding or evaluating performance and power and reliability metrics at the early stages uh, would be very critical and adds a lot of value to, uh, to the simulation uh, or, 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 for, or for the complete system architecture itself. So uh, that concludes this webinar and uh, the session is open for uh, question and answers right now. And please go ahead and uh, enter your questions in the chat window and uh, we will be answering all your questions uh, now and also we will be sending a list of questions and, and answers after, uh, after 24 hours or something like that. So I would really thank for all of you for uh, attending this webinar and uh, we really appreciate uh, your presence. In this.
So please go ahead and uh, ask all your questions in the uh, chat window. Or you can send all your questions to the email address specified uh, in the slide itself. So we have answered for uh, most of the questions in the chat window, and uh, if any of you might have any questions, please go ahead and uh, uh, ask your questions in the chat window itself. So uh, a recorded version of this webinar will be available and uh, we'll be sending it as a link uh, uh, after 24 hours as a follow-up email as well. 